Okay, hello everyone. So this is Hao Shen Li from Peking University and I will be the host for tonight. So tonight we will have three wonderful talks. The first talk will be given from the Hector Daniel, uh, whose talk topic is entitled Causal Model Discovery with Algorithmatic Information Dynamics. So before the talk, let me just briefly introduce the Professor Hector. So Hector Daniel is a senior researcher at the Allen Turing Institute British Library, researcher at the Department of uh, Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. So a uh, University of Cambridge and the leader of the Algorithmatic Dynamic Lab at the uh, Karolinska Institute in Sweden. So his talk will uh, about uh, the causal model discovery with uh, uh, algorithmatic information dynamics. And we uh, then we let the uh, Professor Hector to give us the amazing talk. Thank you. And also thank you for the invitation and thank you for people that are attending today um, for that very nice introduction. So I'm going to be talking about causal model discovery with uh, a framework that we have introduced during the last decade that we call algorithmic information dynamics. And I'm going to be focusing on um, mostly three of these four equations. And I promise this is not going to be very technical. It is a bare view of the field. Uh, but I think these equations are very important. They are almost like fundamental laws of classical information and classical computation. And you may recognize some of them. Uh, there's, for example, Shannon entropy uh, that is based on the principles of classical and statistical probability. Um, that is used for field, in fields like statistical mechanics, and it is mostly descriptive. And by, by that, I mean that it doesn't give you the methods uh, to infer, for example, the probability, probability distributions. On the other hand, we have other measures that are of more algorithmic nature. There's called more of complexity, and I'm going to explain in the next few slides. And then we have also got algorithmic probability, which by the way of coding theorem uh, is related to Kolmogorov complexity. Um, so I'm going to be talking about these equations, but the point that I want to make is that traditionally Kolmogorov complexity has been used and seen as a complexity measure uh, that I think has been uh, undervalued because uh, I think it is deeply connected to causality and that's what I'm basically going to explain in this uh, presentation. Um, so one may think that um, algorithmic complexity or Shannon entropy is almost like um, one more uh, complexity measure and people can pick their favorite. Um, most of these measures can be classified into these categories. Um, I would even put um, Shannon entropy in the same as a statistical, but the, it has a combinatorial component as well. There's um, resource-wise um, indexes that um, care about time and space. Um, then there's the algorithmic ones that I'm going to be talking more about, hybrid ones uh, that use both statistics and algorithmic um, measures like compression, for example. And then there are a lot of uh, many others. Uh, some of them are fractal, for example, with box counting, house of uh, measures, or related to dynamical systems. There's mean field theory, Lyapunov exponents, and so on. Uh, and they serve different purposes. So in classical probability, for example, the question behind is how likely something is, right? In entropy, it is a combination of uh, how likely, but also how diverse something is uh, according to a, a mass probability distribution. In algorithmic probability, what we are um, interested in is how algorithmically likely something is. And I'm going to explain what that means. Um, traditionally, Kolmogorov complexity has been seen as um, answering the question to how random something is. But my point in this presentation is that I think all more of complexity can help in questions related to causality. Uh, and there are a few other questions that I'm not going to go into more detail, uh, but they serve different purposes and each of them have different properties. And uh, one of them is how easy it is to calculate something. So Shannon entropy, for example, is very easy to calculate once you have or you assume the probability distribution. Compression is also relatively easy to um, compute. Uh, in both cases, they are computable. That means that if you run your algorithm, 
then you get, get an output. And by the way, com by compression, I mean popular lossless statistical compression because uh, algorithmic compression is actually not um, entirely computable. And that is called model of chain complexity. And it is actually upper se semi-computable, which basically means that it can be approximated from below. So you can come up with estimations. So a lot of people are, are afraid of things that, that are not computable. Uh, but actually many of these things um, are approachable. And that is a very important message because we are we have been trying to avoid more um, sophisticated algorithms in favor of um, calculating easier. And uh, there is something very interesting and very deep uh, among all these measures. Actually, they are all connected in some fundamental uh, fashion. Uh, but empirically, they are covering and discovering different aspects of the same phenomenon. So just to mention an example, uh, something that has low entropy also has low algorithmic complexity, right? Because if there's a statistical pattern, and actually your distribution is telling you that uh, the generating mechanism is determinist, then its algorithmic complexity is small. And I know that some of you may not be familiar with algorithmic complexity. I'm, I'm going to cover it in the next few slides. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is, for example, for entropy, low entropy and low algorithmic complexity are the same. But when it comes to high entropy, at, at, at least as measured empirically, that doesn't mean that it is algorithmic, low algorithmic complexity. Uh, and I, you are going to see in the next few slides, I have a few examples. Um, so all these uh, measures are somehow deeply related. So let me explain more about called more of um, complexity that was introduced in, in the 60s. And you can see in, in the middle of your screen the definition. And the definition basically tells you that if you want to um, estimate the algorithmic complexity of an, ob an object S, which in this case could be a binary string, then you have to find the shortest computer program P that running on a universal Turing machine U basically produces S. So the output of that program running on that <laughs> machine is the uh, binary string itself. Now you can uh, again think this is just another complexity index, but actually in the 60s as well, uh, many people were trying to characterize the concept of randomness. And there were at least three or four approaches that were attempted. And it was proven uh, by th that time that actually all of them were exactly the same or almost exa exactly the same on, on their very uh, fundamental or uh, basic assu assumptions like um, the degree of computability, for example. So if you want to capture the concept of, sorry, I think someone muted me. Um, so for example, uh, if you want to approach the concept of randomness through uh, predictability, it turns out that the uh, same definition is equivalent to trying to compress uh, the string. And if you want to find all the possible um, statistical tests that can uh, unveil the uh, features of the string, it turns out to be also equivalent to the predictive and compressing definitions. So in some way, it is quite fundamental. Um, so let me give you an example. If, this is a tricky one because um, people have a, a, a quite a limited vision or understanding of uh, entropy from textbooks. And when you ask, for example, what is the entropy of a uh, constant like uh, pi, the question doesn't make much sense, right? Because it is deterministic. So the only uh, gener generating mechanism uh, behind pi is basically the formula for pi and all its equivalences. So the entropy of pi is actually zero because you, you, can, you know exactly what digit is going to follow by having the formula for pi. But entropy questions are mostly epistemological. And if you remember in textbooks, for example, the classical exam example is tossing a coin, right? Tossing a coin has nothing random according to classical uh, uh, mechanics. 
So if you throw a, a coin, you actually, if you have access to the initial conditions, you can tell exactly how the outcome is going to be. Uh, so here's the same. When I'm talking about what is the entropy of the digits of pi, I'm assuming that you don't have access to the generating mechanism and you are only observing the digits of pi as coming out in a stream of digits. And the question is what you can tell about the, that stream of digits if you were using only entropy. And it turns out that entropy cannot see any statistical regularity in, in most of these kind of numbers and in most of these uh, kind of uh, observations because there's no statistical patterns or in other words, you can find any statistical, statistical pattern repeated the same number of times in pi n, especially if you, um, if it is proven that it is boreal normal, for example, which in some basis I think it has been proven. Uh, but when you look at it from the algorithmic complexity perspective, then um, you already know that by definition, and that is very interesting because I just told you that by definition also entropy tells you that is um, low entropy, lowest entropy. So if you can mute yourself, that will be very useful. Thank you. Um, so the, and the definition of entropy in principle for these strings is also the same as Kolmogorov complexity, but, but you have to have access to the distribution for entropy and it doesn't give you any method to actually try to find such distribution. But in the case of algorithmic complexity, uh, it tells you that you can actually try to find the computer program behind. And I know it may look equally uh, daunting to find the computer program that produces the string than perhaps the distribution. But I'm going to show you that actually it is not, that it is fundamentally different. Uh, so in some way, one of my points is I'm saying that Kolmogorov complexity in some way is method, methodological as well. So it, it prescribes a method to actually try to infer the generating mechanism. So here's one, for example, in order to evaluate K, so K is the algorithmic complexity of S, for example, we need to find that P, which is the computer program. And in this case it's A, because there could be many programs. In some very simple cases, you can actually uh, prove that the program that you found is the smallest one, but in some other cases you can't, and that is the uncomputable part. However, for causality purposes, um, one of the main points that I'm making here is that you don't really care about whether it is the shortest or not. In, in causality, what we are looking for is to actually find the computer program or any computer program, ideally shorter than the string itself that produces the string because that, that tells you something, you know, that gives you access to the generating mechanism. And actually by finding one computer program, you can keep try finding others and that keeps telling you, telling you uh, properties of the object itself. Uh, <clears throat> so coming back to the connection among complexity measures, it turns out that actually all other complexity measures are a proper subset of uh, Kolmogorov complexity. That means that they are basically picking up different features of the same object. Um, so as I said, for example, the expected value of entropy is actually algorithmic complexity. Because in the case of pi, for example, you would find that the uh, probability distribution is only those programs that produce pi and all of them are completely deterministic. You can tell exactly what digit is go going to come next. So there's no uncertainty. The problem is that you don't have access to that distribution. So in some way, Shannon entropy is um, some sort of a, uh, measure or approach that has uh, embedded some sort of epistemological failure. Uh, and Kolmogorov complexity um, is also not the uh, optimal solution, right? Because it also has a limited power. So because it is uncomputable, you're not, you cannot always find those computer programs. So it is limited in that way, but the combination can be very powerful especially because you are not giving up with a measure that you already know cannot go be beyond um, statistical patterns, like for example, using channel entropy. Um, 
So let me now explain um, a very beautiful concept that is called algorithmic probability, which is related to Kalmar of complexity in a formal way, as you're going to see in the next uh, slides. So you may remember this idea of the infinite monkey theorem. Um, it was uh, advanced by Emile Borel um, about 200 years ago. And the idea is, is that if you place a monkey on a typewriter and wait long enough, eventually you can you you are able to produce any uh, non-random uh, object. Let's say that you are looking for uh, the works of Shakespeare. If you wait long enough, just by a source of randomness, which is the monkey, you could get it. Eh? But obviously, the probability is so low that you would probably need to wait several times the age of the universe. Eh? But things change radically if you change the typewriter with a computer. Because now if you have a computer, you don't have to type letter by letter of, uh, let's say, Hamlet's um, text. But you can actually write down a formula that produces coherent text, for example. And then you increase your chances to actually hit Hamlet much sooner than just typing at random. In other words, you can type a random computer program and if something has a structure and it is not completely random, then it has a short description, right? And if it has a short description, then you have greater chances to produce the program that produces that object. Let me show it in, a, in another way. So let's take the example again of um, the digits of pi. Let's say that you wanted to type pi and get it right, the first uh, 100 digits. Uh, if it were in decimal, for example, your chance at producing 100 digits would be, would be 1 over 100, uh, 100 to the 10, right? Because it is uh, decimal. So it is very low. And the, the more digits you are required to produce, the lower the probability. Yeah? But what happens if you are required to produce the formula that produces pi? So because pi is not random, it has a short description. So there are many formulas that produce pi then you have greater chances to produce the computer program on a laptop that produces pi. And that is exactly the concept of algorithmic probability. And I hope you see how elegant and beautiful it is yeah? because it is com combining classical probability, but also um, uh, computer science. Yeah? So the space of all computer programs. So the question is how likely is to produce the program that produces the observation that you want to produce. Um, and there is a very nice connection I, I just told you. So if a, if a string has a short description, so basically has low algorithmic complexity, then it has a large um, algorithmic probability. And this formula is called the Cohen theorem. And actually not, not only this is just a definition, but actually you can test it, right? We can produce many uh, objects, both both random and non-random, and then see if actually this equation holds. So before explaining how uh, we approach this problem, uh, let me tell you that this actually is a, a theory that is called algorithmic probability, and it was introduced by Ray Solomonov um, in, in the 50s. And it is actually um, uh, considered to be the answer to artificial general intelligence. The problem is that it is very difficult to calculate, right? And why it is um, some sort of a very powerful kind of AI, because basically this formula is telling you uh, that it has a lot of predictive power. You are coming up with not only the probability, but the computer programs that produce the object that you were looking for. And for any given number of digits, you have uh, the best possible chance to produce the next one from this uh, set of possible computer programs given the first segment of, of your observation. So it is really a very powerful um, tool. Uh, there's a paper, for example, calling um, algorithmic probability and, and the universal distribution because it is some sort of bias towards simplicity. They call it uh, miraculous in some way. And it is a very serious paper, by the way, in, in the mathematical intelligence. 
And even Marvin Minsky at the end of his uh, life said that he would have liked to actually devote his whole life to this concept and that everybody should be working on this because it is very fundamental and very powerful. So that's basically what I've been doing, uh, not full time for the last 20 years, but a good deal of uh, my time in the last uh, 15, 20 years, uh, installing algorithmic probability. And there are many ways to study algorithmic probability. One of them is to actually try to come up with some sort of empirical um, universal distribution. And by, by that, I mean to try to find uh, computer programs behind an observation in an exhaustive and systematic way. So one idea that we have is actually that we can enumerate all possible programs from, from small, smallest to larger, and then go through the whole space uh, exhaustively. Obviously, that is not very efficient. So actually it is not, not only very inefficient, but uncomputable in the limit, but you can make very uh, educated uh, decisions to build or have a partial uh, view of that space. And I'm going to show you some nice uh, diagrams explaining this. But the idea behind is basically that if you have now an observation, what you try to do is to actually run this process and try to find the computer program behind. One problem is obviously that this would take so long as I just said, that it, it wouldn't make sense. But something that we can do is actually to pre-compute this distribution, then save it. And once we have saved it, uh, we can answer partial questions to partial observations. So I have here an example. The example involves the, natural, the sequence of natural numbers and then the uh, translation into binary. If you were going to look at what patterns you can infer with uh, traditional statistics and channel entropy, you wouldn't be able to find um, anything, right? Because actually this sequence is proven to be Boyle normal, unlike pi that it is only suspected. So that basically means that there's no statistical pattern, it's maximal entropy. And you can see what is the problem. Again, this is maximal entropy if you look at the sequence not knowing the generating mechanism because the generating mechanism is basically the successor function. Uh, and this is what we are capturing. So when running our process, we are able to find the um, Turing machine, for example, that produces that string. And actually we can have also the um, automaton uh, diagram. So uh, we called we called this process um, the coding theorem method, as you can see here, because it's basically based on this idea that you can exchange um, algorithmic complexity for algorithmic probability. So what we are saying is basically uh, the most likely generating mechanism is this short computer program that produces this observation. And in this case, for example, we can uh, actually prove that this is the shortest computer program. So it gives them the greatest uh, likelihood uh, to this computer program to explain this observation. Uh, but as I said, the space is so large that actually we had to think of a way to decompose the space into smaller uh, pieces. So first of all, how CTM is uh, defined. So what we do is to run all three machines, uh, starting from the smallest up to certain size, and then uh, divide that by the number of Turing machines that halt. So the number of Turing machines that produce the observation divided by the number of machines that actually halt. And that gives you an, a computable estimation of algorithmic probability that then you can uh, uh, convert into an approximation of algorithmic complexity. But then as I said, we, you have to actually break down into little pieces so what we use is something that we call the block decomposition method that basically tries to explain uh, partial observations and put them into sequence to explain the whole observation. And that actually gives you uh, quite a lot of information. So here's the traditional textbook diagram for how Shannon entropy distributes the values of uh, entropy among all possible string binary strings up to certain size and uh, this is the traditional Bernoulli distribution 
this one here, the, the green one, which is also this red one. Uh, and when you use traditional uh, statistical compression algorithms on the same set of binary strings, you get a very similar distribution. So basically compression is just um, approximating Shannon entropy. And that is a very strong point that I do, I make all the time in my papers because a lot of people use uses compression as an approximation to algorithmic complexity. But actually what they're doing is just basically using Shannon entropy and they could have used Shannon entropy in the first place. But when you use BBM, which has CTM behind, which is this idea of finding computer programs, you actually get a very different distribution that looks like this and conforms to actually uh, the expected distribution, which is a, a long tail. Uh, so what, what this is basically telling you is that there's some uh, depth here behind entropy because something that may have high entropy doesn't necessarily have uh, high Kolmogorov complexity. And the way to understand these diagrams, by the way, is that this element here doesn't necessarily correspond to this one here. So maybe this with highest entropy, it is somewhere here in this area. So that means that it has a generating mechanism that is not necessarily random. It could be even as in the case of pi so, or, or the sequence of natural numbers. So if you don't know the generating mechanism, Shannon entropy would assign it the highest entropy. So it will be here, but actually calling more of complexity would give you the tools to actually start moving into this direction and find that the sequence of uh, natural numbers is actually low randomness, right? Because there's actually an actual generating the mechanisms that you can find in the form of a computer program. Uh, and here are two very basic examples. So actually these two strings are almost maximal entropy, but we found uh, uh, computer programs that are relatively uh, shorter than the computer programs in that space for that size of uh, binary strings. So basically this is already uh, telling you that even when Shannon entropy would um, assign highest randomness to these two strings, they, they are not algorithmic random. So this is the idea behind the block decomposition method. We have some sort of observation and then we sample uh, the space and try to, to, to find a generating mechanism for each of these pieces. And then we put those pieces together and we can tell something about the whole of the, of the observation. So actually the method, how it works is that we traverse the whole thing. So it is not just um, sample as a small part, but the whole thing. And uh, we have a lot of research behind this because obviously there are many ways in which you can traverse something. For example, overlapping or, or not overlapping. If you overlap, then, then there is an overestimation. But if you don't, then, then there's an underestimation because you lose some of the uh, uh, short range uh, correlations between uh, those uh, patches and so on. So this paper basically covers um, everything and it was published in Entropy. So this is a very nice other visualization of what is going on. So you may remember that Stephen Wolfram came up with this idea of the space of all possible computer programs. And it was, I think, his idea. Also, some of some other people may have suggested similar ideas, but he, he actually introduced it in a very systematic and exhaustive way uh, across all science, basically suggesting that if you have some sort of natural phenomenon, you can uh, explore the space of all um, small computer programs and try to say something interesting about that observation. The problem with that idea is the same problem that we had when we wanted to um, traverse old computer programs. That is not feasible. Eh? You have to go through a lot of uh, computation. Uh, so these tools that I'm uh, talking about and we have introduced basically gives you some sort of navigation tools through uh, computer space. So I call it the platonic model space because it is platonic in the sense that you, you cannot actually come up with in a very precise way because it is uncomputable. So it is just the slides of the this, this space. And then algorithmic information dynamics, uh, which has behind uh, CTM and BDM, the uh, methods that I was talking about, basically allows you to find this path inside the space of all computable models, uh, extract it and extract it from uh, the, the space from which it's coming from. And then you flatten the space, you're, ta you're taking the, the 
pathway. And you can uh, basically have a sequence of all the computer programs that explain uh, a small piece of uh, your original um, observation in model space. And then you can come up with something uh, that I'm calling reprogrammability landscape that I'm going to explain later, but don't worry much about it. Something very interesting is that I have uh, that many people are using these tools already. There are probably hundreds of these papers using the tools that we introduced uh, last decade. And I just found a few days ago that actually there's a quantum generalization of these ideas already, also published in an MDPI um, journal, Applied Sciences. So let me come back to how this is connected to causality. Again, when we talk about color of complexity, we are always talking about the shortest computer program. But for purposes of causality, again, we are not interested in the shortest. We just uh, we are just interested in the set of computer programs, and the set is actually the idea of algorithmic probability, right? Because you can see here, this, there's a sum of all the computer programs that produce. This should be an S, by the way. Uh, all the computer programs that produce S when running a, on a universal Turing machine. So this is giving you the method to actually find this piece, the computer programs, and then you can connect it back to more complexity if you want. But basically this is giving you uh, the method to try to find the source code of certain phenomenon. In this case, it is a cellular automaton. This is a this discrete dynamical system that runs from top to bottom and basically applies these very uh, simple rules. So when it finds, for example, three black cells, the next one is a white one and so on. And if you run it, then it turns out that you can produce in some cases a uh, very high complexity. So if you were an observer and you were looking at the evolution of the system, you wouldn't necessarily know how to uh, inverse it and come up with the rules. In this case, it's relatively easy if you know, for example, that if this is a three to one block mapping. Uh, but in general, those questions are not as easy. You know? Systems are noisy, you only have access to partial observations and it, not in the right order and so on. Uh, so it is not as easy as in this uh, case that I used for as an example. Uh, the message behind is that basically we have now some tools to actually come up with some sort of uh, source code hypothesis for certain phenomena. And we have applied uh, um, these tools to many areas, including cognition, for example. So this was a very interesting experiment that we performed with in some sort of a, an inverse Turing test uh, that involved asking people to try to produce the best randomness that they could come up with. And um, this was um, published uh, around seven to eight years ago. And it had a lot of uh, media coverage because of the results and because it, it was an experiment with 3,000 people uh, from all ages. And what we found by applying these five ex experiments, which were related to uh, come up with what people thought would be an, a random output. Uh, this was the result. So those outputs, we compared them to algorithmic um, complexity. So in other words, the best randomness that a computer can come up with, and that's why it is a reverse Turing test, because we are comparing humans to uh, computers, because computers, uh, unlike it is, uh, unlike uh, intuition, actually are the ones that define algorithmic randomness, which is the definition of mathematical randomness. It is quite, quite a counterintuitive, right? But it's actually that's the way it is. And uh, what we found is that if you wanted to explain uh, the out output of all these experiments with things like channel entropy, you come up, you you end up with a, some sort of flat line. So you don't find any pattern. But if you use algorithmic randomness, which is again, this idea of producing randomness with computers, then you find this very interesting pattern. And it conforms to the, with the current understanding in the literature of cognitive abilities. So most people were uh, better at producing randomness when they are 
around 25 years old. And then there is a decline. And this is not anything to be concerned about because obviously in practice, you can cover this uh, from other cognitive processes. No? So it, this was a very simple example where you constrain the time that people have to produce their outcome. Uh, but in all the five examples, we got very similar curves as you are seeing on the screen. Uh, and this is kind of the first time that I think uh, some sort of cog cognitive uh, result was captured by these kind of tools. So that was very interesting. But we have applied it to many other areas as well. So animal behavior, so similar in the cognitive area. So several decades ago, there has been there was this suggestion that uh, if you have a maze and you have ants uh, traversing it, if you place food in places that are more difficult to reach, and by that I mean you need more turns. Uh, it is known that ants come back and tell other ants where the food is. So in this control experiment, they, they are removing any pheromones. That's why these are removable. So they actually have to come back and communicate in some way to the other ants that then traverse again and directly find the food. So that's the way you know that something was communicated. Um, the whole thing is replaced every time. So we know it is not pheromones. So it was a very interesting, even if perhaps controversial um, experiment, but it was um, believed that uh, when you have these pathways that are more difficult to communicate, ants would take longer to do so. Uh, and they couldn't quantify, quantify it in any way because they were using things like compression and channel entropy. And if you look at channel entropy, for example, or compression, they look like flat lines. But when you use um, our tools, for example, uh, called more complexity by CTM or logical depth that we also introduced, you can see a, a clear pattern. So in some way, we were able to validate the hypothesis. The same with another experiment with uh, fruit flies. So fruit flies are placed inside of a cylinder where they display different things on the walls. And it was long believed that um, insects um, just behave very intuitively. So if they don't have any input, they would behave random in the sense that they wouldn't think about it. But actually there were some diodes connected to the uh, fruit fly brain. And it was proven that actually, even in the absence of any patterns, uh, there's some uh, computing happening in the brain. And this is basically what these graphs are telling. So without having access to the actual uh, electrical signal from the diode, we took the behavior of the fruit fly, so the turns left and right, and we were able to actually also validate that in these three cases, uh, the fruit fly is actually engaging in some computational power and in different ways. So when there's a uniform pattern, it does it in a different way. When there's only one stripe, it does it, does it in also a different way. And in all cases, we were able to validate what the original uh, study was um, telling. The same with another experiment with rats. Uh, this, is, this was another very interesting one because it turns out that um, uh, animals can engage in random behavior to out-compete any predator or competitor. In other ways, if you are being chased by a predator, one possible strategy is to appear random. So they, they cannot predict what is your, going to be your behavior and have more difficulties to um, reach you and, and chase you. Um, so again, we were able to show that when rats were engaging in these uh, random patterns, they were actually doing so on purpose. So they were actually engaging in some uh, brain activity to, be, to, to appear to behave random. So let me now um, come back to what we call algorithmic information dynamics. 
which is some sort of calculus, discrete calculus uh, for perturbation analysis. Uh, so we have already talked about having an observation, for example, a binary string, and then come up with the computer program behind or the set of computer programs that are able to explain, in other words, uh, produce the binary string. Right? But what happens when you perturb the original binary string? Then you can look at the model space, at the space of all computer programs, and see how that changed, changed the possible computer program that produces a new string with a zero. So here is very interesting because this is a very simple binary string with ones only. And the original computer program that explains this string is very simple. It is just uh, printing ones up to the uh, length uh, of the string. But if you introduce a zero in the middle, then you have to add a new line of code. So basically your original uh, program size almost doubles. So the small random perturbations to trivial strings have a very significant effect in model space. Uh, but if you have a string that is uh, random, in this case, it is not binary, but it works exactly the same when it is binary or not. If you want to explain this uh, uh, original random object, uh, because it is random, you cannot compress it into anything. So you have to use just a print of that object. So the size of a random object, the size of the computer program that produces a random object is about the size of the random object itself. Right? In other words, you couldn't compress it by much. So what happens when you introduce uh, a perturbation, in this case, for example, at 29, then you have to explain the 29 here, but again, because you couldn't compress it, if it is a random perturbation, the size of the computer program that explains the new piece of information is about the same size as the previous computer program, unlike this one. By the way, this one will be missing the new line if I wanted to be explaining this other string. So it is a slightly different example. Uh, in other words, when the original object is random and if you apply a random perturbation, uh, the program size, the explaining model or the set of explaining models don't change by much, if anything. So that's a very nice way to actually find out that the original object was random if you apply random perturbations. So this is again very interesting because you don't know anything about the original object. You start making perturbations and then you look at model space and actually it tells you something about the whole uh, object. And then you have the cases in the middle, right? the complex um, strings. So this, this is a wrong example, by the way. Uh, this is just the first one, but imagine that this string is complex. So it is uh, neither simple or um, random. And then if you apply some perturbation to that complex um, object, then the resulting computer program will be something between these two cases, right? It would be still compressible to some extent, uh, but it would have some impact. And this uh, idea is actually quite powerful because you can take, for example, now strings that are generated by different mechanisms that you concatenate. So this one, for example, the first part of the string is uh, very uh, trivial. So it's not random. And the second part is random. Then you can apply this perturbation analysis and actually f find the inflection point where you can um, make a cut. And um, basically you are finding the two generating mechanisms for each part. And obviously you can generalize this to um, any type of objects as, as we are going to see with uh, networks. Then you can also take um, objects, um, original strings, for example, and then try to apply perturbations and make that original object more or less random. And you can do so. So you can see how beautiful this theory and method works uh, in practice, because you are taking an original string and then asking the method, okay, make it uh, or, or extract the part that only that looks random or extract the part that only that looks uh, non-random. And you can see also that lossless compression algorithms don't have this sensitivity to deal with these kind of uh, cases because we are only 
perturbing a single bit at a time. Uh, and this kind of uh, methods has have all sorts of applications uh, for things like, for example, rec reconstructing images. Uh, you may remember the Arecibo message that was sent to the space. It, it looks like this one, but it was sent as a single stream, so in linear form. So we are basically assuming that if aliens are getting this message, they they have to know that it is a two-dimensional and they have to they they know how to put it back together and obviously there is there is a huge assumption but what, what, what we have shown actually is that they can use our same mathematical tools and they would actually find the dimension the correct dimensions of the original message so in some way the geometric information or the topological information of the message is embedded in the message itself when it is not random and this has all sorts of applications, including, for example, uh, medical imaging to reconstruct uh, multiple images uh, that have been taken. And then you have to reconstruct, for example, a bone. And we have shown that it's also useful in that case. And we are now moving also towards dynamical systems. So to infer the actual equations in the, in the form of computer programs and to find the actual dimension of uh, a dynamical system. So we have done this with cellular automata, for example, which as I said, it is a discrete dynamical system. And we have been able not only to reconstruct the single snapshot, so we scramble each of these guys. I'm not showing the scrambled version. I'm only showing the original one and then our result. But behind you can imagine that we scramble, for example, this guy, and then we come up with this solution. So in um, and I'm actually showing the worst possible solution uh, among all the hypotheses that we generated for this um, output of dynamical system. So in this case, for example, you can see that it's kind of the reversed one, but we also got this one because it had the same uh, algorithmic complexity. But then you can also ask about the time index, right? Because this is giving you a single snapshot. We basically reconstruct the dynamical system, even when it, uh, in the face of a lot of uh, noise, so completely scrambled. But we could all scramble it and then also ask for the time inference because that's the whole point about a dynamical system. Right? You want to know how it was constructed, not the end outcome. In this case, it goes from top to bottom over time. So with this perturbation method at very big information dynamics, we were also able to give a very good um, a hypothesis of how these systems were constructive and you can see that there's a lot of noise but actually this, this noise uh, is uh, convergent so you require more computer power to keep uh, reducing the error rate and in some cases you get it wrong but it's still a very good in this case you can think it is like a scientific hypothesis of where this is coming from when you scramble it uh, remember you don't have these descriptions at the beginning you just have the scramble version and this is what we came up with, which is some sort of particle going from left to right, which is similar to this one, but this is kind of entangled in a more difficult way. <clears throat> anyway, you can uh, translate all these to graphs and, and do exactly the same. So a graph has the description and you can also uh, define its complexity and find the most likely computer programs that can explain a graph. And you may ask, how do you do it for graphs if you, we were talking only about strings? So actually we use, for example, two-dimensional computer programs. Uh, so with Turing machines, they are called termites, for example. And the question is, uh, what is the probability of a Turing machine to produce uh, the Jets a Jetsacy matrix behind a graph? So we have just, translated the problem into a two-dimensional native um, algorithmic complexity problem. And again, we can do all the block decomposition method. Uh, we decompose the original adjacency matrices into small uh, squares for which we calculate the algorithmic probability and then put it in sequence. And basically that explains the graph. And again, there's all sorts of technicalities. What do you do with the boundaries, right? Because these are together. So you can take it as a, a torus, for example. 
uh, and there's a whole paper about it again. And you can do all sorts of um, tests to um, see whether this is working or not. And this is basically solving an important problem with graphs because a, a graph, an unlabeled graph, can have many adjacency matrices representations, right? And that will be the problem with entropy precisely but because it will be looking at how you represent the um, object and that wouldn't be invariant to Shannon entropy, but it is invariant to algorithmic complexity because there's a short computer program that sends you from one to another description and that is of fixed size. So it's basically just a constant. Uh, so we create a, a graph to show, for example, that entropy would assign highest entropy to the uh, degree sequence of this graph that we created with a very nested uh, computer program. But the computer program is just deterministic, so it produces exactly the same graph all the time. So when you look at the degree sequence, it looks like with almost maximal entropy, but the agency metrics, and this is a labeled graph, so it has only one, looks very low entropy. So this is showing you how uh, channel entropy fed with uh, different descriptions of exactly the same uh, object can have divergent, completely divergent values. Uh, but if you use algorithmic um, complexity, then you have uh, convergence because of the invariance theorem. So there are a lot of uh, uh, advantages. And then you can apply the same uh, idea of perturbing a graph and actually looking at what is the contribution of every element of that graph to the whole, right? So you have some sort of information spectra after applying perturbation analysis on every edge and every uh, node. And again, just as with the strings, you remember we were able to uh, deconvolve strings. We can also deconvolve graphs. So if you have a graph that is all connected but has been generated with different generating mechanisms, we can decompose it into its um, original components by generative mechanism. So this is very powerful. And then we also connected it to uh, dynamical systems and I'm aware that I'm running out of time. So that's why I'm going a little bit faster. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, uh, results about this um, work because then when connected it back to dynamical systems, we were able to find that we can perturb a graph and actually uh, control its dynamical properties, such as the number of attractors or the, or the number of uh, re reachable states, for example. And it is different for different types of graphs. So it is not trivial, but in the, all, all cases, it was statistically uh, significant. And we apply these ideas to uh, biology, in particular genetics, this is E. coli, for example. Uh, we found that the way in we, which we cluster by our algorithmic um, analysis, we were able to find uh, genes in clusters that are devoted to different purposes. Again, with statistical significance and in three different genetic browsers, so genetic uh, catalogs or that databases. This was an, another example of a stem cell um, uh, uh, specializing into a TH17 immune cell and how it looks over time in three steps and how it, it looks completely locked in, in the last step, which is what you would expect from a cell that comes from a state where you have both nodes that or genes that you can pair top to make it um, more or less random. And at the end, basically, you cannot do anything with it. So it is more difficult to reverse it in, in one direction than the other. We were also able to reconstruct the landscape of uh, a stem cell becoming different cells at different times. Uh, and this is a paper in case you're interested. So these are um, some of the uh, papers that you can explore further if you're interested in some of these things that I've been talking about. Uh, just uh, a few pointers or resources, my own web page. We have a complexity calculator where you can do uh, all sorts of things, mostly with strings, but I think we also have uh, four graphs. Uh, our lab um, 
link where you can find source code in many computer uh, languages. And in R, for example, it is native, so you can call a package that is called ACSS that basically implements all our functions. Uh, there's the Scholar PDA article on this topic as well. Nature produced a video explaining uh, our causal deconvolution. Uh, a new book is coming from Cambridge University Press. It's called Algorithmic Formation Dynamics. And Springer published this one last year explaining CTM and BDM. So I'm going to stop there because I think we don't have much time for questions, but thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor Hector. Uh, that's a very amazing talk and both theoretical and empirical. And uh, uh, meanwhile, you, you can see that Professor Zhang has opened his camera and, uh, and Professor Zhang uh, is a host and, and who, who funded this uh, special issue of the Entropy Magazine as well. So let me give a brief uh, review of the today's complex systems and that uh, Entropy special issue. So we, we know that uh, nowadays in the complex systems, the uh, causality is everywhere. However, uh, how we can identi identify the causal emergence from this complicate, uh, complicated causal structures and to infer the future evolutionary states is a very challenging problem. So Professor uh, Zhang Jiang uh, in Beijing Normal University and Professor uh, Cui Peng in Tsinghua University, they initiated a special issue named Causality and the complex systems in the entropy magazine, leading the direction of the emerging uh, technologies such as uh, machine learning, mutual information decomposition, causal inference, and hope to providing us with new solutions. So now we are very glad to welcome the Professor Zhang Jiang from Beijing Normal University. And also we have the uh, Professor Hector here to have a chat. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Hanyu Zector. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, you, you, you have just given us a very interesting talk and uh, you just applied uh, the uh, algorithm uh, information dynamics on different uh, systems. Uh, uh, I, I, I have just your talk, but I, I found uh, one point I'm not so clear. Uh, I don't know if you can help me to understand. So you, you just uh, uh, use um, for, for given, for given, um, uh, for example, binary string, then you can use the algorithm, al algorithmic uh, complexity to calculate uh, the, the complexity of this string. And then you, you per, per, tape, per tape this uh, string. Uh, for example, you can update one, uh, one bit of the binary string. Then you calculate uh, again the, the, the complexity. And uh, am I right? I'm sorry. Yes, that's absolutely right. So what you then do is do. Compare, compare the original program to the new one, and you can compare it in many ways. One trivial one is the size, for example, and I was talking about what happens with the size difference. So what yeah. you're seeing is on the dynamical space, you're seeing something going on, and on the computable model space, you're seeing um, what happens when you ch make changes into this space. And then you can compare the set sets of uh, computer programs because also remember that with algorithmic probability i was mm -hmm. only showing you one computer program but actually you come up with a set of computer programs which is even more powerful because you have a set of possible hypotheses explaining your observation and then you have this the original set of explanations the new set of explanations after perturbation and you can compare and as i said the trivial comparison is just size but actually, if you have the generating mechanism, you can compare in any other way. You can actually inspect the computer program or the set of computer programs and see what was the difference with the or the, the new set. Ah, I see. So, yeah, but but how how about if uh, the the change of the uh, pro, uh, code space is very large? Uh, what I don't know if it is a, a, a difficult. Yeah, so that's that's precisely the point of why we came up with CTM and BDM, because basically we take small segments. So it is incredibly large, but what we do is just to uh, patch everything together. So we try to look for small pieces and then we put it together in a sequence. And that has been already very powerful. It means that basically it's giving you a, an um, upper limit. It is, it is not the shortest computer program, but it is still a computer program that explains the original observation. And as I said, because you have a lot of computer programs, 
that produces the, produces the same observation, then you can do all sorts of inspection. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, yeah, you, you have given a very uh, exciting talk and I hope you can enjoy uh, this talk here. So thank you, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>